Amen, amen. Good morning, church. Thank you, worship team. That was such a great time. Singing, crying out to God. One of my favorite things in the world is gathering with the church and being able to sing. Um, and man, you guys do it well. You really do. I, uh, I told Pastor Kyle the first time I, I spoke with him months ago, um, you know, I, I just turned on one of your live streams just to see what Boulder Mountain was all about. I was like, man, your church sings. Like on the live stream, you can hear you guys singing, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing because it's a picture of what I believe one day heaven will be like, where we're gathered around the throne with the angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, we see that in Scripture, and you just look across this room even, and you see different generations singing together. Um, it's a beautiful picture of the church, and so... Uh, it, it's an honor for me to be able to be here uh, with you guys again. Uh, again, my name is Brian. I was here a couple months ago with you guys. And uh, Pastor Kyle uh, just celebrated his 50th birthday. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was pretty exciting. Um, I don't know if he's still riding a bike or if he's done riding the bike. But uh, any, any cyclists in here, anybody like that's, that's yeah, not me either. So, like, when I found out he was doing this, I was like, what? That's, that's just not my wheelhouse. That's not my thing. And mostly, I got to be honest, it's because of the outfit. Like, I, I just don't get it. I, I know it helps, and it's like wind resistance and all that, but we're going to move on. Um, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, let's open up to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, Samuel is just a few books into the Old Testament, so if you're turning uh, your Bible open from the left, it's going to be about an eighth of the way in. If you get to Psalms, you went too far. And if you're using a device to read your Bible, you just got to click on the one that says 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16, if you're there with me, say amen. amen. If you need another second, say slow down. All right, I'll wait. All right, that's good. Thank you for being honest. All right, here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel. The Lord hasn't chosen this one either, Samuel said. And then Jesse presented Shammah, but Samuel said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. And after Jesse presented seven of his sons to him, Samuel told Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. Samuel asked him, "After are these all the sons that you have? Well, there is still the youngest, he answered, but right now he's out tending the sheep. And Samuel told Jesse, send for him. We won't sit down to eat until he gets here. So Jesse sent for him. He had beautiful eyes and a healthy, handsome appearance. And the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. And so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully. Everybody say powerfully. powerfully. It came powerfully on David from that day forward. From that day forward. Have you ever heard somebody say, this is not how it's supposed to be? Have you ever said yourself, this is not how it's supposed to be? I've said it in my life. I've thought it. I've cried out to God and I've said, God, this is not how this is supposed to be. Uh, particularly uh, a few years ago, um, we all remember a, a crazy time in history called COVID. Um, the, sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that word, but for the story, I had to say it. And, um, you know, obviously when COVID hit, and one of the things I love about this church as I get into this story here, um, when COVID hit, churches shut down, right? 
I mean, churches were closing their doors. And a lot of it was because churches just didn't know what to do. Um, and we had never seen something like this before in our lifetime. And so churches were just confused about whether or not it was safe, um, whether it was proper. Everybody had an opinion about it. Um, and, of course, we know uh, a lot of you ended up uh, checking out Boulder Mountain because the, the doors um, stayed open and, and we continue to preach the word and lift up the name of God in this place. And um, the church that we were at at the time in Tucson, Arizona, was one of the churches that uh, chose not to meet. Um, and so I was a worship pastor at that point. And uh, a worship pastor that is not leading worship on Sunday morning does not have a lot to do, so it turns out. So um, we started doing the live stream thing. And so I didn't know a lot about live streaming, but I, I full in, you know, started teaching myself about all that. And then we slowly started meeting back in person. But when we met back in person, all of a sudden something happened at our church. Uh, the church leadership decided they wanted to go in a new direction. And that new direction didn't include me because that direction was to actually take a step backward into a different era of music. Um, a little bit about my story, I didn't grow up in the church. Uh, the very first worship song I ever heard was um, Forever by Michael W. Smith. And so I missed an entire book of church music because of when I came into it. And so I looked at the pastor and I said, listen, I, I want to be a part of what God is, is doing here, but I don't know that I can be this person to lead us in traditional hymns because I just don't have the background in that. Like, that's not my experience. That's not my comfort level. That's not my skill level. And so here, Brittany and I had found ourselves. We had moved 2,000 miles from Detroit, Michigan, out to Tucson, Arizona back in 2018. And now three years later, we're like, what? Well, what do we do? This church that we took this massive step of faith for is going in a different direction. Like this, this is not how this is supposed to be. So we, uh, we ended up parting ways with the church um, in a in very loving way. I mean, that church blessed us so, so well as we left there. Um, so well that we were able to take some time and, and figure out what we were gonna do next. Well, I got a phone call from a church in California and um, Brittany and I, at this point, we're praying, God, send us anywhere, just don't send us to California. <laughs> so I got this call from this pastor in California. He says, hey, Brian, I saw some of your videos of you leading worship online, and um, rather than doing the traditional interview process, we think it would just be cool to bring you out here to California so you can come uh, visit and worship with us and just see what we're all about. And I was like, you know, that's kind of cool. I kind of like that you're not like rigid and going through like the normal process. So I said to Britt, I was like, hey, you want to go check out Sacramento, California for a weekend? She's like, why? I'm like, <laughs> so we ended up uh, in December of 2020 going to visit this church in California. And honestly, the weekend was great. I mean, even though we were in the midst of all the COVID stuff, everything was still like semi-closed, but kind of open. And we were like 10 feet apart. And I mean, it was weird, but um, we really enjoyed our time with the church. And I just told Britt, I said, I'm always going to wonder if we don't do this, what if, what would have happened? I'm always gonna wonder. So, we loaded everything up from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we drove 900 miles north to uh, a community that was just south of Sacramento, uh, near the Modesto, California area. And um, we got there, Valentine's Day 2021 was my first Sunday there in church. It was awful. I looked at Brittany and I said, what did we do? Not awful because like the quality of anything was awful, awful because like the church we spent that weekend with back in December was not the same church. I'm talking, people just didn't care. People just weren't like on the same page that they said they were in December. And like there was tension and there was weirdness and there was just all this, I'm like, oh my gosh. And later that night, I actually got a phone call from one of the board members who was upset with the way I did things on Sunday. 
Anybody ever gotten one of those phone calls at your job from somebody in charge after work? And so I was upset. I'm like, I, I don't, this is not how this is supposed to be. This is terrible. And then I got a phone call from the pastor. I'm like, reprieve. He's going to come fight for me. He's going to tell me everything's going to be okay. And the pastor told me I need to figure out a way to fix this because the board member was upset. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm 900 miles from Tucson and Tucson wasn't even home. Detroit is home. Like, this is not how this is supposed to be. So church, just shooting straight with you. I made it five months. I got fired. Fired. Not because of any type of inappropriate behavior or anything like that. I got fired because they just didn't like us. You want to talk about at-will employment? There it is, right there. They don't need a reason. They can just do it. So now, we're in California. <laughs> we can't afford to live there. And I, I'm, I'm just absolutely at a loss for what God is doing in my life. So we made it till October and our bank account had just run dry. So I said, let's, let's not go back to Michigan because I don't know if I can do the snow right now. I said, let's just go back to Arizona. We'll land somewhere in the Phoenix area and we'll just, we'll go from there. So I actually got a job at Carvana um, as a corporate trainer. And it was a great fit for me because I, uh, the Carvana would hire people like between 50 and 100 people at a time. So like I would train people in like this setting for five weeks. I mean, it was like, God, you, you totally made this happen. This is amazing. This is incredible. Well, if you know anything about the news in the last year, six months into that job, I got laid off with 2,500 other people. This is not how it's supposed to be. Like, what is happening? I mean, you want to talk about heartbreak? You want to talk about confusion? You want to talk about frustration? This is that to the 10th. I mean, it, it made absolutely no sense to me. This was probably the most chaotic time of my life. And I've been through some stuff in my life. But this was probably one of the times where I just could not figure out a path forward. I found myself in the middle trying to just get my bearings to get through the day. I mean, have you ever been there where like you find yourself saying, I'm just trying to get through the day? Like maybe for you, you've been in a situation where you're in between jobs and you're like, this, this is just not how it's supposed to be. This is not how I thought at this point in my life, this is what this was going to look like. Or maybe you're at a job right now and, and you're like, I don't actually want this job. I don't like this job. This is not what I thought my professional career path was going to look like. Maybe for you, you're, you're waiting on a diagnosis. You're waiting for healing. Maybe for you, you're in between relationships. You're going through a divorce or you've lost a spouse or your children or your grandchildren. If we're just being real this morning, they're at that age where you're like, when are you going to be through this? because something's wrong with them, amen? It's not what you thought it was going to be. Maybe you're ready to retire, but you can't. You're trying to get in shape, but you're just not seeing the results. I mean, church, that middle place is really hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to be in the middle. You know, there it is. Sorry, they gave me a new piece of technology here. Yes, got it. Church, I, I want you to read this this morning and I want you to take this in. This may not look like the way that you thought it would, but God still works miracles in the middle. Amen. I'm gonna say that again because there were only about three people that actually took that in. <laughs> this may not look the way that you thought it would, but God still works miracles when we're in the middle of something. And church, I'm standing up here to tell you my story didn't end after I got laid off via Zoom with 2,500 people. My story did not end when I got fired from a church in a state we wanted nothing to do with. 
That's not where my story ends. And I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what you're in the middle of this morning, but I can tell you, your story doesn't end in the middle. And that's what we're gonna look at this morning in the life of David. Um, this morning, uh, as I came up here, um, I asked this young lady here, Hannah, um, I asked her what her name was because I didn't know what her name was, but I just said, what is your name? She said, Hannah. I don't know if you saw the eye contact that was happening here this morning. Um, obviously, they're related, so there's gonna be a connection there, but there, there was something else that was happening here that I love to see because as I said, um, I used to be a worship leader. I led worship for 17 years. Um, I was a musician long before that. I picked up my first pair of drumsticks when I was eight years old. Um, I, I've just, I've been around music for a very long time. Some of you are trying to do math in your head right now because you're wondering how old I am. I'll keep you in suspense. So I loved the connection that was happening here in the transitions especially at the end there when uh, we were singing, you were worthy of it all. And I was even kind of sitting there going, hmm, I wonder how they're gonna get us in the same God. And Hannah over here, like she hammered down on that first note of same God. So that way they, could, they knew where it was. They found it, they knew where it was. And this seamless transition happened between those two songs. Did you notice that? Maybe not. Maybe you take it for granted because your worship team is just so good. But I wanna tell you, that is not the norm in a lot of worship team settings because the transitions are actually the hardest part of the entire set. It's not getting through the different songs that are on the set list. It's making all those songs work together. And what you don't realize is how much time your worship director puts in to crafting a worship set, not just picking songs, but trying to make sure that the keys work together of the songs, trying to make sure that the flow of the songs goes together. I realized over the last 17 years leading worship that the transitions are actually some of the most beautiful times in worship because God does incredible things in the midst of transitions. And I, I realized years ago that it's those transition times that I have to figure out how to avoid wasting them. We can't waste transitions because sometimes it's in those transitions, incredible things begin to happen. So if you're taking notes this morning, that thing, are you guys also moving it too? You are. All right, keep me on my toes. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. The title of my message is Don't Waste the Transition. Don't Waste the Transition. So David's journey to the throne was a pretty long one. I don't know if you realize that. Um, Israel wanted a king. They saw all the other nations had kings. Um, they had just gone through this, this, uh, this season where you know they had judges, people who, um, and again, like if you know your Bible, they weren't judges as like courtroom judges. I mean, there was an aspect of that because uh, they're leaders, they needed to make decisions, but the judges were really people who were just people trying to steer Israel in the right direction, hear from God, lead them in the right direction. Um, occasionally they, they were prophets, uh, but they were people who needed to just keep Israel on track and it, it just didn't work. It just wasn't happening for them. And so Israel started to get anxious. They said, listen, they have a king and 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 it's starting to work for them. Why don't we have a king? We want one. And so if you know your Bible, you know that um, there was a man who rose up to be the first king and his name was Saul. You guys ever heard of Saul? Saul was, uh, the Bible tells us, he was a head taller than everybody else. And that's an interesting point because when we go back to this passage where Samuel anoints David, what is one of the things that God tells Samuel? It's not about his appearance that he's gonna be looking for, but that is one of the factors when we see Saul become king is that everybody noticed how tall he was, even to the point where it was time for him to become king, he tried to hide, but this dude was so big that he couldn't hide. And so he became the first king and just being like transparent about his time. I mean, 
he wasn't a good king. Like, he messed up a lot. And it was like the more he messed up, the worse it got. And it was a snowball effect. Um, and it really came to a head when, when God removed the anointing was when uh, he was supposed to wait for Samuel to make an offering to God. And Saul said, man, I, I'm not waiting anymore. What Samuel does is not that big of a deal. I can do it. I'm just going to make this offering on his behalf so we can move on. Big mistake. And that was the moment when God said, Saul, you're done. I'm anointing a new king of Israel. And so you would think in chronological order, that was the moment Saul lost the anointing. That was the moment David was anointed. That's when he became king, right? Church, it was 15 years from the moment that David was anointed to the moment that he finally took the throne. 15 years, David was in the middle. 15 years, this man was in transition, trying to figure out what God was doing with his life. Because as frustrating it is when we don't know what God is doing, imagine, we all pray this way, God, if you would just tell me what my next step is, Imagine God did tell you what your next step is, but then say, oh, but you got to put the brakes on for 15 years and wait. I don't know about you. I get pretty impatient. And one of the relief factors when I'm impatient is I don't know what I'm even being impatient about. But if I know what's coming, I don't know how I would have handled it. Definitely not in the way that David did. Those 15 years probably didn't look like the way that David assumed that they were going to look. So we're going to look at five things this morning. I know preachers typically will do three things. I'm doing five because that's just the way this, this scripture played out. And everybody's excited that you have five points for note taking this morning. Amen? Amen. I actually believed a couple of you over here. Thank you for that. All right, so if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, in transition, we need to remember to be excellent. In transition, be excellent. Again, looking at verse 14, still in chapter 16, it says, now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul and an evil spirit, everybody say evil spirit, an evil spirit sent from the Lord, we'll talk about that in a second, began to torment him. Oof. And so Saul's servant said to him, you see that evil spirit from, from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command your servants here in the presence to look for someone who knows how to play the lyre, an instrument, a stringed instrument. And whenever the evil spirit from God comes on you, that person can play the lyre and you will feel better. And then Saul commanded his servants, find me someone who plays average, right? Right? Is that, is, that what the, is that what your Bible says? Are we reading different translations? No, it says, find me someone who plays well and bring him to me. Find me someone who plays well. All right, let's back up for a second and talk about this evil spirit portion because this is where a lot of people get hung up and they're like, why would God do that? I mean, if God's a loving God, if God's a good God, why would God send an evil spirit? Depending on how you study this passage and interpret this passage, what version, um, if you're going to the original language, if you're going to a translation of a translation, what this is talking about is God allowed this spirit to torment him. God allowed this spirit. And where, where do we see this happen in scripture elsewhere? Um, we see this with Job. We see when the devil actually came to God and said, um, the, the only reason Job is who he is is because you're protecting him. Remove your protection, and I guarantee he's going to buckle under the pressure. God said, I'll allow it. Go ahead, torment him, do what you need to do. And so this is the same scenario. The language that we see used here in 1 Samuel 16 is the same that we see in Job where God allowed this to happen. And what we need to remember is even though God allows it, he's still sovereign. 
He's still in control. Even though an evil spirit is tormenting Saul in this passage, God is still seated on the throne. But sometimes God uses things that he chooses to use in order to fulfill his purpose. It may not make sense to us. We may look at that and say, well, that's so mean, God. Why did you do that? But God said, I need to get David in front of Saul, and this is how it's going to happen. So Saul and his servants agree that we're going to get a a great acoustic guitar player in the palace so that they could soothe him. They're going to play same God on loop over and over and over again. So it'll soothe him. And Saul takes a second to say, but make sure it's somebody who plays well. Make sure they play well. In Psalm 71, verse 20, it says this. It says, you experienced me to cause, you caused me to experience many troubles and misfortunes, but you will revive me again. You will bring me up from the depths of the earth. So this struggling, this angst, this thing that's happening, like this is not unusual. This, we see this all throughout the Bible. We see this connection with these people from a time that we don't understand with the life that we live now where people are going through some stuff. Saul wants a musician who plays well. And David in 30, Psalm 33, 3 says this, sing a new song to him and play skillfully on the strings. Why does this matter? Why does it matter that we do something excellent? Why does it matter that we do something well when we're talking about serving God, when we're talking about living for God? Because I'll tell you, in a couple decades of ministry, I've met a lot of people who are like, just bring God what you got. He'll do what he does with it. While that's true, the heart and the mindset needs to be different behind it because I believe we serve a God who is worthy of my best. And while there may be a scenario where maybe the worship leader gets sick on a Saturday and I don't have time to prepare as best as I normally would, but I'm still gonna get up here on Sunday and do my best. But you better believe if I've got all week to prepare for that, I'm going to prepare all week for that. Think about your job. If we're honest, there are days where we're just there. We're just existing. We're just getting through the day. We're just getting through the week. We're just answering another email. We're just going to another meeting. But what if we showed up to work this week with a mindset and an attitude of, God has called me to be the best in this season of right where I am. And so I'm going to show up and do that thing well. I'm going to be excellent in that thing. And that is going to be my act of worship. This job may not be where I want to be forever. This relationship is not going the way that I thought it would. My parents are are, are just going crazy and I don't understand what's going on, but I am still going to do My part with excellence. Church, we can't control everything that happens around us, but there is still one seated on the throne who is in control. And so even when it doesn't make sense to us, even when we feel like, you know what? I'm in the middle. I'm in transition. I'm not going to be doing this the rest of my life. What does it matter? I'll tell you what it matters because A.W. Tozer famously said, what, you, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. If you don't think God is worthy of your excellence, I would challenge you that you don't understand God's worth. Because when we come to him and we sing and we say, you are worthy of it all, that's in every season and every situation. He is worthy of our excellence. We do the best that we, very, that we can now, church, This is not perfectionism. There is a difference. I struggled for a long time trying to make details perfect. I shared with you when I I was here a couple months ago, I believe we serve a detail-oriented God, and I, I found some freedom in that. But I also believe that there does have to come a point when we're trying to do things with excellence where we say, God, I'm giving you my best, and I'm trusting you with the rest. This is what I've got, and it's 
everything. It is my very best. And I realize this person may be able to do it better, but this is what I've got. So church, when we're in transition, we need to do everything with excellence. Amen? Number two, if you're taking notes, number two, in transition, we need to be faithful. Look at the person next to you and say, be faithful. Look at the person on your other side who's clearly your second choice at this point and tell them, you be faithful. You be faithful. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're moving along through this story here with David. Verse 12 says, chapter 17, verse 12, still in 1 Samuel. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite from Bethlehem of Judah named Jesse. Jesse had eight sons, and during Saul's reign was already an old man. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war, and their names were Eliab, firstborn, Abinadab, the next, and Shammah, the third. And David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David kept going back and forth. Everybody say back and forth. He kept going back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's flock. Okay, so picture this. David was already anointed as the king. I don't know about you, but if God calls me to something big like that, I'm thinking, "Woo, let's go. What's next? And God says, go back to what you're doing. Wait, we just had this big moment, this, this life-changing thing, and you want me to go back to the field? What? But I wasn't really doing anything out in the field. You do understand if I go back out in the field, I'm not going to be able to change the course of history, right? But David was faithful, and he went right back to the field. But then Scripture takes a moment to tell us that his brothers did their duty in war, and they followed Saul into battle. His three oldest brothers go into battle, but David's like, uh, wait, no, uh, oh, oh, no, I got it. Oh, this is so hard. So what does David do? He does both. He stays faithful to the field and he stays faithful to the front line. He keeps going back and forth to make sure that both fronts are covered. Now, this is pretty inconvenient. This is not very glamorous. This would have been a lot easier if he would have just stayed there or went there. But he was committed. God had not yet released him from his previous task, even though he knew something else was ahead for him eventually. So church, what it means to be faithful, it means that you stay put until God tells you it's time to move. And in today's social media, fast food, drive through multiple lanes in the drive through Chick-fil-A culture, like it is so easy to be like, oh, I'm just going to move on to the next one. That line's shorter. I'm going there. It's easier if I go there. Up, oh, I follow them on social media. It looks like they've got it going on and this place doesn't, so I'm going to go there. But God does not honor that mindset of I'm just going to do what's easiest for me. God honors faithfulness. And David shows us that even when it's inconvenient, even though when it's hard, sometimes we have to stay put until God says, it's time to move on. Until you hear God say, it's time to move on, stay put, stay faithful, and even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's frustrating, you honor God when you're faithful in transition. Number three, in transition, be ready. Everybody say, be ready. Be ready in transition. Be ready. Continuing on in verse 20, still in chapter 17. So David got up early in the morning. He left the flock, all right? So he's going. This is it. He's not going back and forth. Now he's going. He left the flock with someone to keep loaded up. He set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp 
as the army was marching out to the battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster, and he ran to the battle line. And when he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. And suddenly, he was, as he was speaking with them, the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line, and he shouted his usual words, which David heard. Uh, you heard the story, David and Goliath? Yeah? The entire world has heard this. This is one of the greatest sports analogies to this day of David and Goliath. So that's the point we've now gotten to. I don't know if you realize the timeline here of, of David's transition time from being anointed to being king. This happens in the midst of his transition. David fights perhaps one of the greatest battles of all time, of all history, while he's in transition. But what's interesting here is the whole reason he ends up showing up on this battlefield is because his dad told him to bring lunch to his brothers. The whole charge that Jesse had gave him was to take some bread and some cheese for your brothers and go serve them lunch on the battlefield. So he took his Lunchables, he went to the front line, and he said, hey guys, what's going on? And he heard this giant, this big, ugly, nasty, this, this Philistine just shouting these terrible things. And David had this moment where, I mean, jaw wide open, and he's looking around at the rest of the Israelite army, and he's like, are we going to do anything about this guy? He can't talk like that. And even though David showed up for a different purpose, listen to this, he was ready for what was in front of him. He went there for a different purpose, but he was ready for what was in front of him when he got there. Sometimes when we're in transition, we think the next step is going to look one way. Or we think the time frame of how long we're going to be in that, that middle part, that season of transition, we think it's going to look a, a certain way. But church, you have to be ready for God to say, oh, and by the way, you weren't expecting this, but I'm giving this to you. I'm blessing you with this. I'm calling you to this. You have to be ready for that. When I got laid off from Carvana, it was really sad to see because a lot of my friends and my coworkers from Carvana like went into this pit. They, they, they spiraled. And I mean, these were people who, who didn't have the hope that, that I had in Jesus, even though I tried to like build that bridge with them. But I, I watched these people just get into this depression where, I mean, literally, some people stopped shaving, stopped cutting their hair. Um, I had, you know, friends of mine who, like, hadn't showered in, like, days. And in my head, I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, you might get a phone call today from a potential employer that says, hey, I've got an open spot for an interview in 30 minutes. Can you be here? And I said, you better be ready for that moment. You better be ready for that situation because if you wait until the moment is on you to do something, it's going to be too late. Church, we have to be people who follow God in a way that say, God, I'm ready for anything at any time, no matter what it looks like, no matter what comes my way, I'm ready for it because I'm constantly fixated on you. Whatever it looks like, whatever that means in this season of transition, whatever you need from me, I'm going to be ready. And so, you know, some of my friends, I, I was like, hey, update your resume. Like, be ready to send those resumes out. Go shave, take a shower, you stink. Like, maybe that's a word of prophecy for somebody in the room right now. I don't know. <laughs> but you need to be ready for something that may happen. Um, I work at a company here in Mesa called Branded Bills. Um, we are a custom uh, apparel company. We uh, started by making hats primarily, but now we've branched out into other apparel things. And um, I took this job a year ago, um, not really sure what it was going to lead to, but I needed the work. And uh, so I, I, 
I literally sent my resume to the manager um, in the sales department. Um, and again, if you didn't hear earlier, I've been a pastor for 17 years, and now I'm going to be a salesman. Um, and uh, the, the manager called me. We talked on the phone for about three minutes. And uh, he said, all right, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll give you a call back. I'll let you know. And I just, I went to Brittany, and I'm like, I don't think that went too well. Like, that guy didn't seem that interested in me. I don't really know. Um, he called me back the next day, and he said, hey, can you start in two weeks? I was like, oh, um, yes, I'll be there. Yes, absolutely. He said, I just got a good feeling about you talking to you on the phone. I'm like, we talked for like three minutes. I, but here we are a year later. Um, I've been promoted twice over the last year, which is very cool. One of my first promotion was based on like my sales numbers, which was cool. But the second promotion I just got, I'm starting to see God like do what God does. We're like, oh, maybe this wasn't a random job. Oh, God, maybe you're actually doing something in this middle part. Oh, so I got promoted uh, about three weeks ago now to a team lead position amongst our salespeople where I now have a team of people that I lead, which means I get to speak life into these people. I get to encourage these people. I get to uh, motivate these people. I get to have like those hard one-on-ones with them. But ultimately, I get to breathe life into people and say, hey, keep going. Like, keep fighting, keep moving. Like, we're going to figure this out. Uh, we're going to make some changes. We're going to redirect a little bit. But, And I love the phone call that I had with my manager when, when this went down because he said, you've already shown that you're a leader, so it just kind of makes sense to put you in a role like this. And I thought, that's it right there. I didn't wait until the promotion came to start being a leader. I was just doing what God had always called me to do and to lead people. And the way that I did that in this job was I was just encouraging. I was supportive. I did my job with excellence the best that I possibly could. And God did what only he could do. Church, if you're in a position where you feel like you're in the middle of something, you have to be ready at all times for whatever may come because you don't know when it's gonna be. And if we boil it down, if we're just completely real this morning, you never know how many days you have left here. We hear stories of tragedy every single day of people going through all sorts of medical things that we've never seen our world go through before now. You don't know how many days you have left on this earth. This earth is actually a transition if, if you think about it. This is not your final home. This is not your final resting place. Our home is in eternity with Jesus. And so you need to be ready. And that's not to say you check out, man, I've, I've, I've done life with these, these saints before where we just check out and we say, oh, I'm just waiting for the Lord to come back. Anybody heard that one before? Oh, I'm just, I'm just waiting my time. Jesus can come back anytime now. That's great. Yes, it could be anytime, and we can just wait for it, but we need to be ready. And in the meantime, we have a purpose for why we're here. You were called to make disciples, to go to the ends of the earth, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You were called to love God and love people. That is what we are called to do. And so you need to be ready at all times for a conversation to happen, for a possible promotion, for tragedy to strike, and you can step into it and just be there with somebody and pray the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You need to be ready at all times. Number four, we're almost done. Number four, be confident. In transition, be confident. Again, looking at the story of David and Goliath, chapter 17, beginning in verse 34, David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, I struck it down, and I rescued that lamb from its mouth. And it, if it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, I would strike it down, and I would kill it. For your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And then David said, 
the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Church, David was confident. And it was not like this egotistical confidence. He was confident because he knew who he was in God. Samuel anointed David. Saul, he set David up with his armor for battle, which didn't work at all. But God was the one who called him. God was the one who said, you are my son. You are the one that I will use. You are the one that will lead the Israelites. You are the one with whom my child, my son, the savior of mankind will come from your line. David was confident in who God was. Do you have that kind of confidence? That in the face of your giant, you can say, I know who God is and therefore I know who I am. Do you remember the story of Adam and Eve when the serpent comes to Eve and he doesn't question who Eve is, he questions what God said, right? He says, did God really say that? Did God really say you can't eat from any tree? And Eve is like, no, 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 he didn't say I can't eat from any tree. Satan does that same thing with Jesus later on. With Jesus, he's baptized and the the spirit descends on him and the heavens open up and God says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And then he goes into the desert to fast for 40 days. And what is the first thing the devil says? He says, if you really are the son of God. Church, the enemy has the same playbook over and over. He has nothing new up his sleeve at all. And so we need to be people who recognize the difference from what the enemy says and what the word of God says. Because the world may say that man and woman exist in this way or they don't exist in this way, but we know that God created man and woman in his image and there is no debating that. There is no way to make that different because God's word said. We need to know the difference between when the enemy tries to confuse us. Did God really say that? Is that really who you say you are? And we need to have the confidence to go, I'm ready for battle because I know who God is and I know who I am. And you know what? I'm just, I'm looking at, I'm looking at you two right here right now because you're all like, this guy is kind of weird right now. I'm looking at this front row here, okay? I want all of you sit up straight. Sit up. Put, put your chin up. Get your head up a little bit. Get, get your shoulders back a little bit as everybody's slouching now, typical students. Like, my prayer for the church is that we are people who walk around with our heads up and our shoulders back, and we say, I'm a child of the Most High God. And people look at us and they're like, are you crazy? You just got fired. Six months later, you got laid off. Like, how? And it doesn't matter because I know who I am because I know who God is. That's my prayer for the church. That's my prayer for students in this church is that it doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what comes our way. We know we have confidence in the same God who brought David out of the field where he fought these these beasts. He's the same God who brought him to the battle line with Goliath. He's the same God who brought him to the throne to lead Israel is the same God that we serve today. We need to be people who are confident even in transition. Number five, partnered with confidence is humility. We need to be people who are humble in transition. Confidence cannot be a trait that you have aside from God, that you have apart from God, because it'll get out of control real quick. That's people who are like, I'm the best, I'm the toughest, I'm the smartest, I'm the strongest. When you couple that with humility, you see a godly character like we see in David here. That, this is why we call David a man after God's own heart. 
yeah, David messed up because he's not Jesus. There was only one perfect man to ever walk the face of the earth. People say that all the time. Well, why is David a, God, a man after God's own heart? He screwed up too. Certainly did. And I'm thankful for it because I have learned how to also be a man after God's own heart. It's with confidence and humility. We're going to skip to chapter 24. Chapter 24. Still looking at 1 Samuel. Beginning in verse 5, it says, Afterward, David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, I swear before the Lord, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. I will never lift my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. And with these words, David persuaded his men, and he did not let them rise up against Saul. I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. So at this point in time, David had become a mighty warrior. And as David would come home from battle, the Bible tells us that the men would actually sing, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. And this confidence and humility thing was something Saul didn't have. And so all of a sudden, Saul became very paranoid. He became very upset that the men were praising David. And so he was getting mad that this man who was his servant, who, who humbly, loyally served him, was now being praised. And so in his mind, he's like, I, I got to get rid of David. David's the worst. I, I, just, I can't let this, this boy continue on in my palace. And so as David would sit there and play same God over and over again for the king to calm him, Saul just got madder and madder. And there was one day he takes up his spear and he throws it at him. And David, in his awesomeness, just goes, whoosh, and keeps playing. But it happened a second time. Like Saul tried to play it off, like, oh, sorry, I just got a little crazy. And his son Jonathan's like, oh, come on, man, my dad doesn't hate you. That's, that's, that's not real. I mean, that slipped out of his hand. I mean, clearly, I mean, but it happened a second time. And Jonathan's like, David, you need to run. You need to get out of here because my dad wants to kill you. And so David goes on the run, and he's with his boys. They're hiding in a cave. Saul is chasing after them. And Saul says to his army, he says, stop. Thou needest to useth the bathroom. And he steps into this cave to relieve himself, to urinateth. Now picture this for a second. David's hiding. And Saul steps right up here. And I know the distance is this close because the Bible tells us David was able to take the corner of his robe and cut it. So, I mean, there, there had to be a pretty close distance here at this point. It's like, you know, the, the awkward men's bathrooms where it's like urinal on top of urinal. It's like, hey, man. So they're like this close. Saul finishes what he's doing, walks off, and... David jumps up and he goes back to his guys. He's like, whoo, that was close. And his boys look at him and they said, you could have killed him. Our running would have been over. Our season of transition and being stuck in the middle would have been over if you would have just killed him. Why didn't you do that? I mean, this is the moment where like David picks up his phone and he takes a selfie while Saul is doing his thing. And then he, the caption he puts on there is, should I or shouldn't I? And everybody starts commenting. They're like, kill him, do it. Because yeah, like, that's what happens is we want to ask the world their opinion of what we should do. David's guys are going, you should have killed him. And David says, no, because he is the Lord's anointed and I will not raise a hand against him. But here's what he did. The Bible continues on in this story, and it says that after Saul left that cave, David also left that cave, and he holds up that piece that he cut off. He says, hey, Saul, I just wanted you to know how close I was. But I also want you to know that even as you try to kill me and you chase me, I will never raise a hand against you because you are the Lord's anointed. 
Church, there has to be this spirit of humility in us when we're in this season of transition because we will always come across moments where it's logical for us to take things into our own hands and end it. End that season of transition. But that's not how God intends the situation to play out. Paul says in Philippians 2, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourself. Everything you do should not look to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. It can be so tempting when you're in the middle to get out of that situation before you're supposed to, to jump into a situation God did not call you into. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God's timing is the only timing that matters. You may be tired of waiting. You may want this season of transition to be over, but if God hasn't ended it, it's not done for some reason. Church, as we close this morning, I want you to think about this, this slide again, this phrase again. This may not look the way that you thought it was going to look at this point of your life. I am right there with you. I am right there with you. This, this may look completely different than you thought it was going to look. But that does not mean that God does not still have something in store for you in this season. That does not mean that even though things are kind of off balance right now, that God still can't do something miraculous in the midst of that. And who knows? Maybe this season of transition may end up becoming the foundation for something new. Maybe we're so busy looking to what we think is ahead that we forgot to just focus on what God has given us in the here and now. So, church, be excellent in everything that you do. Be confident, be ready, be humble. The old saying goes, if you're not currently in a storm, you either just came out of one or you're about to go into one. The same is true for transition. If you don't think you're in transition right now, that must mean you just came out of one or one's coming. So be ready. Be ready for that time. And watch what God does through your intentionality in that season. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are the same God the same God who was faithful for generations to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the same God who parted the Red Sea for Moses, the same God who spoke to Mary and said, do not be afraid, the same God who called, anointed, fought with David, and put him on the throne. You are the same God who is with us today, this morning. You are the same God who hears us cry out in our frustration and in our confusion. You are the same God in every season, in every situation. And so Lord, I pray this morning for an outpouring of strength over Boulder Mountain this morning for anybody watching online. God, I pray in Jesus' name for a fresh outpouring of your peace. God, I pray in Jesus' name for stories upon stories of how we see you move in these middle moments, in these situations where we feel like we are in transitions. God, I pray for those, those stories where we say, I saw God do something miraculous. We're trusting you for that this morning, God. We're believing you for that. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said.
I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.